do to this insightful presentation. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> Appreciate that introduction. Sounding okay? I will proceed. So, as Megan uh, said, I am the chair of the Utah Biomass Resources Group. I co-founded the group with Dallas Hanks, who has since passed away in 2010. Um, these are our uh, partners uh, with uh, the Biomass Group, the uh, BLM, the Forest Service, uh, the Utah Department of Ag and Food, and the Utah DNR, uh, the Department of the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands in particular, and Amaron Energy is a private company that we work with quite a bit. And uh, the group is convened by us at Utah State University Cooperative Extension. How we got into uh, biochar in the Uinta Basin, which is what this uh, presentation will be about, I'll give you just a minute or two of background here. As a biomass group, we focus quite a bit on the pinyon juniper resource in Utah. There's 10 million acres of it in Utah and 50 million acres uh, surround in the Intermountain West. Um, and it's an expanding resource. It's taken over a lot of sagebrush and grasslands. Uh, the BLM in Utah alone is cutting 40,000 acres a year, treating 40,000 acres a year of pinyon juniper. Uh, so there's a real need to find a use for this material so we can afford to treat more acres because uh, it's, it's at $200 an acre at least. Uh, it, it becomes cost prohibitive. But uh, the slide on the right uh, is pinyon juniper biomass, chip pinyon juniper. The problem with it and all woody biomass is that it's mostly fluff. It's air and water and some carbon. And so you can't afford to haul it very far with today's uh, gas and diesel prices. So they are, one of our big focuses is to um, condense, to densify the the biomass before we take it out of the woods. And so one of our bigger projects is, uh, is a mobile pyrolysis machine. This is the machine owned by Amaron Energy. This, op this photo was taken about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, in Eureka, Nevada. They're working through this uh, mountain of pinyon juniper chips you see in the foreground on the right. And uh, in that trailer, uh, you see there's a, a mobile pyrolysis machine that uh, the white bin feeds the, the pinyon juniper chips into the machine and uh, it pyrolyzes it or cooks it in the absence of oxygen, uh, makes biochar and bio oil. So we're focused quite a bit on what to do with this biochar and, and this bio oil. We've been putting on uh, meetings and sort of dog and pony shows around the state and different places. One of our bigger focuses has been uh, in Bernal in the Uinta Basin with all the mining that goes on there. And um, this is a group of the folks that uh, on the site that we're talking about today that have, have been working towards this. Um, I'll tell a little story here about two folks that aren't in this photo. Um, at at our, that original meeting in Vernal, um, uh, in 2013, um, one of our friends and uh, cooperators from Nevada, Dusty Moeller, a biocharist who's uh, tuned in with us today. Hello, Dusty. Um, was uh, gave a presentation about biochar and included some photos of typical reclamation practices from his point of view. Pretty quickly, uh, somebody from the audience, uh, Stephanie Tompkinson, who works for QEP Energy doing reclamation, um, uh, went right up to Dusty and said, hey, that's not how it's done. What's, uh, can I take you out and show you how it's done? And so um, they had that meeting, and one of the results is they looked at this site that uh, it was a failed reclamation site. I've been trying for years to get stuff to grow on this, and only cheat grass has grown on this site. And uh, so they agreed to turn it over to us to, uh, to turn it into a biochar trial to see if we can do better. Um, and so over time, uh, and, and at these meetings through Dusty and others, we got to meet Chris Peltz. Uh, here's Chris on the site who is leading the, the project and will uh, lead the rest of this uh, webcast. Um, we've been to the site several times. Chris can tell you way more about it than, than I can, so I'm just going to turn it over to Chris from here. And uh, thank you for that uh, minute or two of introduction. Okay. Uh, is everyone, can I, am I heard okay? Hope so. Yep, I got you loud and clear. Great. Okay, thanks Darren for a great introduction. Thanks Megan as well. Um, 
Uh, yeah, my name is Chris Peltz, and I've been working with Darren and the folks out at QEP for about a year now on this project. And uh, I, I also wanted to highlight, we have, a, in addition to our co-authors here, Darren and Stephanie, on this project, we also have another a bunch of key collaborators that the project would not have been possible without. And uh, Dusty has been really key, Dusty Muller now at University of Washington. Uh, Scott Bell, again, has been really key in, in a lot of these biochar projects across the West. And uh, Jonah Levine at Confluence Energy has been incredibly important at uh, generating the material and providing material for these projects. And so thanks to all of, all of those folks that have really contributed a lot for this. So I want to just quickly uh, review what we're looking at here. This is the site, and what you're seeing is two lines of biochar. And I want to be specific about what I'm referring to when I say biochar in our instance here. And so when I'm talking about biochar for how we are using it here, I'm talking about a commercial product from wood with a fixed carbon content between 80 and 90 percent, a particle size of between 1 and 4 millimeters, a surface area of 150 to 350 meters squared per gram, and delivered in one to two yard super sacks that generally have a dry weight of about 400 pounds per yard or 150 odd kilos per meter. So that's what I'm talking about when I say biochar. All right. So uh, let's, let's go on one slide here and see if my controls work. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to quickly tell you a little bit about my background and why I'm interested in this. Maybe some in the audience have uh, been to Swords in Colorado. It's located in the southwest corner of Colorado. Uh, it's a really beautiful place. And one of the reasons um, it's so attractive to so many people, especially some of the first white settlers, is because this area is highly mineralized. And what you have, uh, what we're seeing in this photo is some example of that uh, mineralization and subsequent exploitation of those minerals. And so what we have here is sort of a legacy of about 150 years of mining in this region where I live. And I think this is fairly typical of a high elevation uh, mine dump near a water source and in, in areas that are difficult to, to revegetate. And so for me, uh, this is a really interesting project in that it both has a lot of, uh, there's a lot of intellectual uh, interest for me, but as well it's, it's personal because this is where I live and, and this is my backyard. So finding new ways to uh, reclaim and reestablish restoration plants on these sites is really exciting. So let's go forward. But we're going to talk about uh, Bernal, Utah today, and Bernal, Utah uh, is sort of our touchstone. The project site is a little south of Bernal. Um, but this area is important for a lot of reasons, and it's really interesting in a lot of reasons in that it's located uh, south of the Wyoming Red Desert. It's located, it's located east of uh, the Wasatch Front and the Uinta Mountains, right here. And it's located north of the Colorado Plateau and west of the southern Colorado Rockies in the Green River Basin. And the Green River Basin has a really interesting geologic and climatologic history that for our purposes really begins about at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, KT boundary, when this region was a jungle and uh, uh, swamps and jungle and a river marsh, analogous to what the Amazon might have been. And then if you fast forward several million years to the middle Eocene, where, a lot of, where this area is mostly a shallow inland lake, and those two uh, relics, geologic relics, uh, kind of give rise to what we have there today and some of the mineral resources that we have there today. So here's two photos of an area near the White River, which is sort of cuts east to west across the southern Uinta Basin. And you're looking at two photos here, two air photos, one from 2006 and one from 2014. And so what we're looking at are some of the development that has happened in the last 10 years with respect to some of the oil and gas. And this area has really seen uh, a lot of expansion and uh, a lot of exploitable mineral resources. Uh, the USGS estimates that the 
uh, available in basin resource for this area is, is, is likely uh, 1.3 trillion barrels of oil, which is only slightly less than uh, Pyance Basin, which is just a little east of here in Colorado, which has an estimated uh, resource of about 1.5 trillion barrels of oil, making it one of the, the largest oil shale deposits in the world. So we expect that there will be additional development and additional land disturbance in these types of areas. So thinking about ways to mitigate some of those effects is really uh, front and center on a lot of folks' mind. We came to this project partly because uh, folks had been doing uh, reclamation work across this area and noticing that for a lot of sites, what they were doing worked just fine. They would uh, do their normal uh, practice, and they would seed, and they would do a green mulch, and it would, it would work okay. Some of the sites, some proportion of the sites, do largely because of high saline soils or a lot of clay particles, or the site was very dry. Uh, what ends up happening is uh, the soils become uh, pretty saline, the weeds dominate, uh, the companies have to come back and spray for those weeds. And you end up with a uh, negative feedback loop where these sites become more saline and it's harder to establish vegetation. So that was sort of the, the big problem that we're looking to overcome. How to address areas within sites and sites such as sites like this where normal practice wasn't One of the ways we think we know how to do this is by adding fixed carbon. Current practice is a lot of adding these pieces to the soil. So adding decomposing organic matter, uh, your fresh residue would be your growth matter, and any of your microorganisms. So this is a key element of a healthy soil, which uh, a mining affected soil and a low carbon soil it's not going to have a lot. The, the trick with adding only this stuff is that these are very label and the effect of adding these pieces uh, is short-lived. So we think that adding biochar, which is really stabilized organic matter, will help sort of balance out the additions that we might make and, and hopefully get us closer to this type of soil when we're starting with something. And if the material was free and it was readily available and, and it was available all the time, it would probably be very easy to uh, use it out in this area. But because uh, the cost of the material right now relative to how much we want to be able to use it, it doesn't really line, it's, it's too great. We have to think about, in terms of economic value, what is uh, what is the use, what is the utility and the value of adding biochar to an area like this, to a landscape like this? And we have to figure out a way where if we're going to use the biochar, the value of it has to exceed its cost. Part of our uh, method for understanding what the value might be was to work with our industry partners and Stephanie Tompkins in, in particular to figure out what, what, was the, what were the kind of problems that we want to address and what were some of the concerns uh, an entity like this would have in using something new. And so we asked them, why were you even interested in the project? Um, and why do you want to do this site? And what did they see as both some of the potentials and some of the drawbacks of using this material? And so this all fed into our uh, model of understanding and helped us design a set of experiments that helped to answer both these questions and that big question of what, what is the value. Some of the current practice that uh, industry is doing includes uh, spreading topsoil, spreading straw mulch, adding fertilizer, roughening the soil, and using 
and using various uh, snow fences or soil water management to see if you can't overcome some of the uh, really tricky parts of establishing vegetation in a high desert. And so these are some of the things that QEP is already doing and what we're trying to uh, determine to see if biochar can either reduce, substitute, or enhance some of the things already being done. Along with uh, being very responsive to industry needs and, and thinking about how this material might work within their existing practice, we also really wanted to make sure that we were working with our agency partners to determine and make sure that adding biochar material is synonymous and works in concert with their overall strategy for reclamation. And so I want to highlight two, two items here in, their, in the BLM's gold book. And these really jumped out for me was that uh, what they're trying to do is to set the course for eventual ecosystem restoration using natural processes. So as a great design parameter, if we want to use natural processes, it's going to limit some of the inputs we're going to do, uh, but it's just going to have to make us be a little more, uh, a little more creative on how we're going to use this material or how we're going to use it in concert with other things that are being done. So two of the key things, two of the key hypotheses we have with using the biochar is that by adding the fixed carbon, you're going to increase the overall percentage of fixed carbon in the soil and the overall extent of stabilized organic matter in the soil. And so we started this work at other sites looking at what is the range of what is the range of soil organic matter in depleted soils versus healthy sage step soils. And we looked at different additions, sort of a unit volume per area, to see if we can not start to approximate the characteristics of a healthy soil by additional additions of biochar. The other hypothesis we have was that adding uh, porous carbon is going to improve hydrologic process in soils. And so I would highlight just two things here where uh, the same soils, these are both soils from the Vernal Basin, and this is about a month into a growth trial. And I think what we see here highlighted in the green uh, food dye is that the water is draining nicely in the biochar addition soil, whereas these soils with the uh, very low carbon content, we end up with uh, sort of a clay lens and not much uh, infiltration. And so we have less effective rainfall and, and, and probably more erosion or more potential for erosion. The other thing I would highlight here is that you can see uh, the fine roots through the unamended soil. And if you notice here in the amended soil with the fine roots, one phenomenon we've noticed in some of these growth trials is that surface biochar will, will migrate downward in the soil profile along with the, the roots. So we get an interesting feedback where as the roots penetrate further into the soil, the biochar is also penetrating further into the soil. And, and, and so that, that seemed like a, a positive uh, impact and something that would be also uh, synonymous with this natural process. So given what we knew uh, or what we had hypothesized about biochar addition, we went out to the site last year in the fall and we looked around uh, different oil well pads and looked at the type of reclamation that was being done. And what jumps out very quickly is that you see in some sites or within a site, you have really good establishment. Um, this taller, darker stuff is a green mulch. Uh, it's a sterile barley that's planted. So a lot of that will go away, but you can see there, there is a gradient of uh, good establishment to poor establishment, even across one site. And then from just a different perspective, from the same point, you see an area where we're getting very low establishment. And that may be due to higher saline soils, more compaction. Um, either way, uh, what we try to do is get soils from these types of areas 
and see if we couldn't uh, develop some mechanistic models and narrow in our prescription for what type and how much biochar we would want to add in order to get this to look a little bit more like this. So with those soils, and over the winter, conducted a series of greenhouse trials. We controlled for everything except the soil amendment. And what you're looking at up here is a, a typical uh, for the region soil amendment uh, with a fertilizer, a nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer, a gypsum, a gypsum plus fertilizer, a biochar plus fertilizer, a biochar, and a biochar plus gypsum. And so this was about after a month. We took these growth results, cut all this vegetation down, dried it, and measured the above ground biomass, and used this as, as and used and used this as our scoping to come up with our field field prescriptions. Um, I would highlight here this was what uh, current practice is. This is adding gypsum and fertilizer and some straw. Uh, this highest one was adding the current practice plus about a 30 yard per acre volume of biochar. And this one at the other end was adding a very low rate of only biochar. So we used, so we used this graph to come up with our field prescriptions. It may seem like we have a lot of treatments here, but this list is really uh, a summary of the prescriptions we did in the greenhouse. And a couple of points I would make here is that because this is the field site, um, this is about a two, two acre site, uh, north to south orientated, north to south, but with a prevailing wind coming out of the northwest and the southeast. So we try to align our treatment plots along the prevailing environmental gradient, which was strongly controlled by wind. Uh, we noticed that the wind was uh, highly episodic, too, with in the morning the winds coming out of the southeast, and then almost like clockwork at noon, the winds shifting to the, out of the northwest. The other thing I would point out here is that the site is somewhat domed with these areas here, the shading representing the slope and the relative elevation. So then we had a low spot over here, we had a low spot over here, and we had built some berms, but this, hot, this was sort of a high spot over here. These yellow dots, these are the straw bales that we put out. These blue dots are the soil chemistry probes we put out. And then the treatments are listed. And I can have, we can ask more questions about that at the end. So when we found the site, when we arrived, the site had been uh, treated with herbicide and disked such that there was essentially no surface vegetation on the site. Um, there was patches of grass here and there, some patches of cheap grass. Uh, but more or less, the site was devoid of vegetation. So one of the first things we did on uh, some of our treatments, some of our straw treatments, was to spread straw at the rate that is currently used by QEP and to run our equipment over it and run the disc, a, uh, a light disc over this to work the straw into the soil profile into the first couple inches and, uh, to represent and replicate uh, existing practice. We added biochar in a couple of ways. Uh, for the material that we got in bulk, uh, we added it in, this is about a third of a yard. We added it in front end loaders. For the material that came in super sacks, uh, the super sacks have some straps at the top, and we essentially drove the uh, forklift uh, back and forth and spread the material such that we knew how much per area we were using based on the volume in the super sack. Once the material was spread, we lightly ran the equipment, the light equipment across it, uh, and ran a light disc across it. 
and we also tried to find uh, clumps and spread those out by hand, with the final, final result looking somewhat clumpy. Two of our other experiments at the site, um, we created a, a series of berms along the northeast edge uh, with the berms uh, seeking to replicate soil storage areas. Uh, a lot of these sites, when they're cleared initially, they try to stockpile the surface soil. And one of our working hypotheses is that uh, by adding the char during soil storage, uh, you might improve the condition of the soil uh, during its storage, or it would be less impacted by be being stored in a berm for a couple of years. We also added uh, compost manure to some of the char. Uh, the compost manure was uh, graciously donated by South Slope Reclamation and um, had been, we've been working with them as well to think about how to and what might be the best way to combine fixed carbon with different forms of compost. So we think this is, has some promise to it, uh, it's still sort of in the preliminary stages. I mentioned the straw bales, and you'll see we have a series of straw bales here, and they're arranged in uh, various spatial densities. The idea with the straw bale was that if we had create, if we could create uh, a deeper boundary layer at the surface of the site, it will roughen the surface area and hopefully create more deposition deposition of snow behind and in front of the straw bales as the prevailing wind sort of comes out of this way in the winter. Um, we also thought uh, having straw bales would in some fashion replicate the topography of a well-developed stage, stage step. So we were trying to recreate as much topographically as we could with the adjacent uh, sagebrush. You'll also see here a series of flags and a pole. And so this is one of our sensor nests where we have uh, continuous measurements of soil moisture in five different spots. We have soil temperature and above ground temperature. We also planted uh, sagebrush. We replanted sagebrush from here at four spots around each of them next to the, um, the soil moisture meters. This is what a finished plot looked like. Uh, as you can see, it's fairly clumpy. This is an area near the berms. So we tried to be as accurate as we could and spread what we determined to be a 20 yards per acre rate. And in this area, we uh, had the folks from Ponderosa, who did all of our heavy equipment work for us out there, uh, compact different strips of this. So this would be the most compact. Over here would be next most compact. And the furthest one on from us would be the least compact. With the idea being, well, if we, uh, if we could add the char just while we're running our equipment around there, maybe that would be the easiest. And is, is there a way to determine the, uh, the improvement of soil tilth and uh, lessening the impacts of soil compaction by adding just the char on the surface. We also have a series of uh, sagebrush controls. So our sagebrush controls are both on the east, south, and west side of the plots. And we're using these uh, both as vegetation controls and soil chemistry, per, uh, soil chemistry controls. So at all, at all of those points I pointed out with the blue, we put a, at least a pair of these uh, plant root simulator probes. These are essentially resin strips that measure the supply rate of nutrients to a hypothetical plant. And that rate is expressed in uh, milligrams of nutrient per uh, unit area uh, controlled for the length of time buried. And we usually bury them for about a month uh, in dryers, you want to bury them a little bit longer, but about a month is where we bury them. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little bit into our preliminary results. 
Um, we've only had these plots in for six months, so we don't have a lot of vegetation results, but I'm going to share with you uh, both the chemistry results, the, the soil and moisture results, some of the time-lapse photography, and some of our initial status in terms of vegetation. So what we're looking at here is the, what we're looking at are the various biochar treatments, uh, the various single applications of straw, fertilizer, and gypsum. This here is a, a composted aspen uh, to various degrees of composting, and some of it that was slightly charred as well. So it's sort of a, a continuum of not charred to charred, with this being fully charred material plus other additions. Um, we have our QEP control, and then we also have our various uh, sagebrush controls, or, or our regional controls. So what we see here, what jumps out is that uh, ammonium is a strong, con strong addition when we add the fertilizer, and that in general uh, you have a low nutrient status of your controls. We're going to do uh, these again this fall, uh, so we'll, have, we'll start to establish uh, a pattern of maybe how these uh, are more available, less available through time. So this is a graph of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus and sulfur. And I would also point out here, just look at the ratios of calcium uh, to potassium in particular. Uh, very different with our biochar trials, biochar treatments, as opposed to the controls. Um, looks like the, the uh, aspen compost and the uh, sort of business as usual seems more synonymous with uh, less potassium. Uh, phosphorus and sulfur, also the ratios are a little different here with the controls relative to uh, both the QEP control and some of the additions. Uh, the big difference being that uh, adding the gypsum gives us a little more sulfur in the soil, which for these calcareous soils, um, which are also quite alkaline, uh, adding a little bit of gypsum to lower the pH uh, probably increases some of that cation exchange capacity, making some of the nutrients more uh, plant available. Big thanks to Dennis Hinkamp and Utah State University Extension. They came out in November and flew an uh, unmanned aerial vehicle and took uh, really cool video and photos of the whole site. I would recommend uh, taking a look at the video. Uh, there's a YouTube video of it and you can just go and, and take a look at it. It will give you a sense of the scale of the plots and how they are scaled relative to each of the treatments. Um, uh, you would notice here we kind of have the plots along the, uh, the wind gradient. Here's where our uh, straw bale snow fences are set up, adjacent to no snow fences, and we sort of high and low treatments and treatments with and without straw all along the gradient. Here's looking at the other side of that plot, or other side of our, our field plot where you can see the burns, where we have just biochar, biochar and straw, and nothing, uh, and in two, at two rates, uh, low and high. And then we also have our area of compaction with the biochar, and then just with straw or no, no uh, additions. We also put a bunch of game cams, uh, time-lapse game cams, so we could look at uh, both the data throughout the winter and as well as try to see if some of the snow dynamics were working out relative to the, the snow fences. And one thing that we noticed right away is that a lot of the storms came out of the southeast this winter, which was a little different than we had expected. But the other thing that jumped out was, especially these early storms, was that uh, we were seeing, if you go from the upper left here, it's uh, early in December, uh, when it's sunny out there, the ground heats up pretty quickly, and, and likely you're seeing uh, snow sublimating going from solid to gas right away, but maybe by adding this shade, shade, shading that we're cooling the soil enough that we might get some infiltration. So we're seeing this through time where snow is persisting on some of the surface with, uh, uh, associated with the straw bales. This is a little later in the spring, one of the bigger storms. As you can see, uh, in March we can get pretty, even, we can start to get pretty warm, 
as evidenced by how sort of like around uh, on the south part and to the east part of those straw bales, the ground clears up pretty quickly. But with the shading and we think with some of the cooling of the ground, we're still seeing snow remain associated with the straw bales. This is one of the last storms we had in the spring. And this is from uh, perspective of the south, uh, looking from the south toward the north. I would point out that uh, during the day of the storm, it, it was pretty warm out. Um, and then overnight, it gets very cold. We get a bunch of snowdrops. Uh, the next day, the ground's still pretty warm in a lot of spots. And within one day, uh, all that snow uh, is, can be gone. And, and this was even with a sort of overcast day. A sunny day, this happens pretty quickly. So, still an ongoing question. Uh, we have some interesting preliminary data, uh, but this is sort of our, our question uh, we're seeking to answer with these straw bales. Is, does this increase the amount of water that will be available for plants? Can we roughen the surface up enough so we can capture some of this snow and instead of it having evaporate, can it uh, make its way into the soil profile and be plant available? So that was some of the qualitative data. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the, the continuous soil moisture data. So this is the Decagon uh, EM50 probe. These are somewhat new, and they're a time domain reflectometry probe. And what we have is one associated with each one of these flags, and they're labeled as such. So open south, open north, upwind, downwind, downwind six feet. I'm going to just show you a couple of the treatments individually and highlight that um, here's the 20% per volume line. And so things bounced around at the beginning a little bit, but then we started to see a pattern uh, emerge where we had melt events, rainfall events, and we basically, with the straw and the gypsum, saw a fairly similar pattern um, with uh, things bouncing around below the 20%. So this was our biochar plus gypsum plot. Uh, here's the 20% line. Again, uh, things bounce around a bunch. And so this is still, you can see at the beginning here, probably uh, with freeze and thaw and, and the soil settling around the sensors, we're getting a lot of variation. But after the winter, uh, things start to happen in a pattern. And so I'm showing you averages here. And I want to just go back once to point out that uh, this was excluded. This orange line was excluded from the averages I'm going to show you next, only because it was so uh, out of the uh, range. We want to be conservative with our soil moisture estimates. So we excluded this for the next graph that I'm going to show you. So this is the average of all the five measurements of each of the plots. And I wanted to just point out a few of the key uh, events that happened here, along with the black dots. So this was when things started to get cold. This is when we put them in, uh, things bounced around a bunch, and then things started to get cold right around the end of November. And we think this was probably uh, when mostly the soil was frozen or very cold. Uh, this was that snowfall event that early snowfall event happened right around here, and then it got warm, and we had a big melt. This was another snowfall event right here, and a melt. This was a smaller snowfall event, and then these were uh, rain events. The thing I would highlight, especially here, is that notice the shape of the curve here where we have a melt event, we have an increase in soil moisture, but then we have a rapid decline back to uh, pseudostasis. The difference with the biochar plots, it appears, is that the rate of decline is less uh, in the biochar treatments. Not only that, we're seeing a magnitude increase in soil moisture that's greater than it would be without the biochar treatments. So this is interesting in the sense that maybe in, in concert with uh, adding more snow or capturing more snow on the surface, you're creating more space within the soil profile 
to make use of and capture some of that uh, residual soil moisture that's not being evaporated. So the other question we had was, do, do the straw bales, do they do anything for soil moisture? And we had a very interesting uh, event happen, a very interesting experience uh, in the spring here. So you can see from uh, April 14th at 3 to April 14th at 4, we had some straw bales that were here and next to our sensor nest. And then the, the next day, or the next hour, they were gone, or they had moved. And so interestingly, we had a, a sensor nest with a straw bale, and then we didn't. And so one of our questions was, does the straw bale affect soil moisture? And so I would point uh, out to the graph here where this top line was where the straw bale had not been removed. And the bottom line was in uh, the sensor nest where the straw bale had been removed. And this is about when it had been removed. So interestingly, we see the magnitudes sort of get depressed a little bit when the straw bale is gone over all, all the sensors, but likely the ones that are closest to it. Luckily, we did have our game cams, so we did discover who had probably moved our straw bales, and, and it was a headless horse. And so this is a field ecology trial, and all of you that have uh, conducted these types of trials know that a lot of things happen out there that you had not expected. And, and some of the wildlife uh, was something, were things that had not, we had not anticipated, uh, but we're working through. Uh, the other being that as soon as you put a piece of equipment, and the more expensive the better, uh, any animal will find that piece of equipment and do its best to eat it. Uh, so other things we are just uh, working with out there and some of the interesting challenges of doing these types of field, field trials. So. Uh, that was some of the data. Uh, let's talk quickly about the status, where we are right now. Uh, I'll just point out this is about six months. We had a late spring up in Vernal, so uh, everything was kind of uh, dialed back a little bit in sort of time. But the, these photos are going to be from June 30th of this spring. Uh, and for Vernal, this was still spring. Uh, as you can see, we had some variable results. We had some really exciting results. Uh, from sort of high vegetation to low vegetation and then a continuum across our treatments. Still early, so we haven't done uh, community analysis yet and we're still, uh, we haven't done a full vegetation workup yet as we're waiting until some of the more of the species that come up can be differentiated and we can kind of see what is both the community and what's the cover after a full year of growth. But just some of our earlier results suggest uh, there is a continuum. And you might think of it as a very high rate to a very low rate, with this being somewhat of the continuum you might expect. And these being roughly what you might ex uh, the, the application rates. Uh, this was a special type of application. Uh, these were uh, biochar a company called the New Green and uh, they have a really interesting product. It's a biochar packet, and so we spread these out and to look at uh, what might be the minimum amount you could use, and is there an interesting or another way, an alternative way to spread the material. This material on the left is a biochar and composted, semi-composted aspen uh, with a lot of uh, aspen bark and, and loose aspen pieces. So this would be sort of the other end of the uh, technology spectrum in terms of uh, biochar. Across the sites, this might be a continuum of high to low. And this is kind of what we saw in a lot of places where we had patchy uh, vegetation establishment and, uh, and, and often in depressions. Uh, what was interesting, especially about these types of sites, is that there was quite a bit of char within the soil, uh, and you would notice that as soon as you walked across it or kicked up the surface a little bit, but there was not much char uh, on the surface or less visible on the surface 
and it seemed that that sort of surface char was uh, associated also with vegetation. Here are two plots, just sort of before and after. This is what this plot looked like when we installed it. So uh, pretty dark covering, pretty high biochar rate, also some straw. And this was in June. This was that uh, aspen compost and, and biochar. And this was in June. Three patterns that I thought were really interesting that we'd see is we have this spatial reinforcement where we're seeing uh, the char occur, uh, the vegetation start to occur, and that having a little bit of roughness and end up with a little bit more straw, and it seems to have a little bit of a virtuous cycle in terms of the vegetation. We also saw these sort of spheres of influence, both with the sagebrush that we installed and the, and the snow fences. So uh, this is sort of the prevailing wind goes this way along these red lines, and we're seeing uh, within pockets, both behind and right behind the sagebrush and right behind the straw bale, uh, pockets of material collecting and vegetation uh, occurring there. So both of those things, the spheres of influence and the spatial uh, uh, orientation, uh, leads to what I would call these islands of establishment. And we saw this all around the site, where straw would occur on the surface, biochar would uh, flow into it or be blown into it and you'd have vegetation occurring. And then just right near it, uh, you could see the soil was cracked and, and uh, soil crust was forming and not so within our island of establishment. And, and, and so at a very small scale, uh, this is some of the things that we're observing and uh, stay tuned for more information about the vegetation and, and what we're getting in terms of uh, more physical parameter results. So this has been really good about small scale, but we're really trying to tackle a big problem here. And um, we have to back out a little bit and think about scale of the problem and, and how we're going to do this in a big way, if biochar is a useful tool for some of the sites. So just in Utah, we've got many, many uh, potential sites. We've got a lot of, a lot of uh, folks that working out there with a lot of wells. And so we want to consider this when we're thinking about a big strategy uh, for using biochar. Um, I would propose that that strategy has sort of three key elements to it. Uh, the first being understanding where our impacts are going to be or where our impacts are. And so this is just a graph of the number of wells within a particular landscape type in Utah. And so if we know how biochar might work or what its value in this intermountain basin mixed salt desert scrub, uh, our model will allow us to affect a lot more sites. Um, so I would propose that we understand how uh, adding biochar in these sites, this would be a priority. So we could have uh, predictive models on how it would work across a lot of sites. Uh, the other thing that's really important is to still consider geography as a, sort of our guide. And what I've kind of outlined here are sort of three regions uh, where oil and gas development is occurring. And consider these regions uh, in terms of if you were going to use biochar, where would you make it? How would you ship it there? Uh, how would you work it as an entire system? So the geography is really important. And uh, lastly, uh, we're foresters, so we want to overlay and understand our forest resource and how we can best match up our forest resource with the need so we can reduce our, our cost potentially. So we're making the biochar as close to the point of use as possible. And lastly, that transportation piece is really important. Um, I would point out that this is uh, how we're getting material today. We're getting it in super sacks and we're getting it in uh, walking floor trailers. This trailer is about 130 yards and, and everything in between. Uh, so being cognizant of how the stuff is delivered and how we're going to ship it is, is a really important piece and something that uh, shouldn't be overlooked. So just to summarize and, and, and to wrap up here, uh, I would I say that it's uh, really important that we understand our landscape and stratify our landscape with an eye towards thinking about how to use biochar. Uh, 
that we use that information to prioritize where we want to do these demonstration sites so we get the most information for the widest area possible. Um, we conduct our studies uh, on those sites with our industry partners, with our agency folks, so that we're all uh, pulling in the same direction and we're optimizing the char use for, for these sites. We're getting practical information out of it. And I think in the near term, until a market and an industry can develop to supply the char, uh, we're going to be limited in the amount of char that we can get. And so some price support, some cost support for the material uh, is probably going to be important in the near term. And with that, uh, thanks so much, Darren. Thank you so much, Megan, for uh, making this happen. Uh, Stephanie Tompkinson, Dusty, all our partners there uh, have been really crucial to, to this effort. And all our BLM and Forest Service folks uh, have been really great support. And uh, thank you so much. So with that, maybe we'll, we'll do some questions. Or I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Darren. Thanks, Chris. Good job. Um, you, Chris, I'll encourage you to read through the chat pod and the questions that were asked, in particular questions about char and where we got it and how much it costs. Um, I tried to answer them as best as I could uh, using the chat pod, but I'm sure you can do a great better job than I did. Um, I'll just take a minute here to uh, wrap things up and tell you a little bit more about some other projects we have that are related to this. Another biochar project we have going in Utah is applying it to uh, production vegetable farms on the Wasatch Front. The person facing the camera here is Brittany Hunter, USU Horticulture Extension Agent uh, out of Davis County in the USU Botanical Gardens. And her partner, uh, uh, Sean Olson, there with the hat in the background. Um, USU uh, extension agent out of uh, Davis County also um, and there we have four different farms that uh, we're working on this is a grant from the Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education group um, and it's a two-year study to, and we're planting uh, melons and tomatoes in the char and we'll see if it produces better melons or higher quality tomatoes uh, than the uh, accompanying fields do. Um, keep tuned for that. We'll be doing a webcast on that as results come in. Um, just in general, uh, but Dusty Moeller did some research, and if I recall correctly, he sh showed that there's 35,000 well pads like this in Utah now, and each one is about two and a half acres each. And as Chris indicated, maybe 80% of them get reclaimed just fine, but that other 20% don't get reclaimed just fine, and we're hoping that char can make a difference there. So one of our goals and one of our plans, we have BLM funding, to, um, by some descriptions, the vernal basin can be split into four different soil types, and we'd like to have a char study going on each of those uh, soil types and make it part of their best management practices for reclamation. So we're trying to move in that direction. Um, I wanted to just quickly throw out a quick uh, sort of plug for another upcoming webcast I think in uh, November we'll be shooting for. It's a recent project we're just getting started now at USU and that's uh, it's a cross laminated timber uh, construction project at the USU Botanical uh, Gardens where we're going to build a, a greenhouse teaching facility that's it's, 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 its intention is focused on low income youth to teach them how to cook and uh, um, right there in the garden this is how we grow our vegetables, this is how we prepare them, this is how we cook them and eat them um, and it will be made out of this uh, particular uh, style of building uh, cross laminated timber. We just got a grant from the US Forest Service, a wood innovation grant so uh, stay tuned for more on that um, and then finally uh, I just wanted to put up this last slide if you have more questions uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me I'd be happy to talk to you more about this and uh, we're pretty close to the end of our time but uh, if, if people want to sign off you're sure welcome to um, but because uh, our time is nearly up but if you want to hang on for a few questions yeah, you're more than welcome to do so I'll turn it over to you, Megan.
Thanks, Darren. Um, so Charles from MSU Extension asked a question about um, Brittany's study that you just briefly introduced. So I don't know if Brittany's still around or if she um, has time to maybe type in the chat pod and answer it. Um, or maybe you can, Darren. But I'm going to pull up the pod question for um, folks before they check out. So maybe if you wouldn't mind addressing that if, if Brittany doesn't have time. Or OK, she's going to try and answer. So. Before you guys all check out and go to your lunch, uh, please hang around and answer our poll questions. Um, in the meantime, I'll 